Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Lloyd and I source cars for people on a professional basis. Although most of the cars I source are between £1,000 and £5,000, very often I've been asked to show something a little bit cheaper on the channel and so I came up with no budget reviews. The series where we look at cars that you can buy in good condition with an MOT for under a thousand pounds and you can enjoy driving. We don't film this in an expensive manner, we don't use separate microphones, we don't use do it head tripods, we don't even use a DSLR but we do have a lot of fun. Oh viewers, why is it whenever I come to London it is cold and raining and wet? But never mind, uh, my spirits are not entirely damper because here is an absolute little delight. A 2000 Rover 25 1.8 VVC GTI. Yes, they did make a Rover 25 GTI. It wasn't just the ZR 160 that was the uh, sporting model during the uh, brief MG Rover era. These were actually launched in 1999, uh, well before the uh, Phoenix 4 got their grubby hands on um, what was left of the Rover group and continued I think until January 2002 was the information I've got. Maybe these were discontinued in 2001, I'm not exactly sure. This car looks like it's actually got unique front and rear bumpers compared with a standard 25. Of course, I, I've owned a 25 myself. It wasn't as nice as this. Um, it was a 2003 uh, 1.4 IL. Um, definitely got unique front bumpers. So the car looks absolutely brilliant, particularly with the, these nice alloy wheels on it. And we've got rear disc brakes as well, which is superb. These cars always had quite a big boot. One of the things that they um, had over some of the earlier Rovers was a little push button to open the boot. The 45s don't have that. Mats, of course, from a 200 series R3 do fit. Um, we might just lift up the boot carpet to see if we've got an alloy spare under here. Uh, mm, yes, we do, viewers. I think that is an alloy spare. Brilliant. Full size, of course. Let's pull up the carpet back there. Very big boot for the size of car. You know, when this car was brought out in November '99, uh, these were completely repositioned in the market after the original R3 200, on which this is quite heavily based, um, was up against things like the Escort and Astra when it came out in '95. This very definitely was against the things like the Fiesta and the Corsa, and I think that's a much better fit for this car personally than uh, what they were trying to do. So it, it meant that it was you know, a big practical super mini rather than a really small family car. There are elements of this car which date back to 1989 um, with the uh, R8 type Rover 200. I mean you can see one element straight away here with these door handles. Not a problem or anything, it's just lineage ran for about 16 years I think in total. So that's my driving position, I'm about 5 foot 11 and uh, I mean it's it's okay in here, it's not like the worst but I could do with a bit more legroom to be honest. And we've got a sunroof and air conditioning. Fancy. Also got uh, some nice map pockets in here actually and that's lumbar support for the driver's seat. I haven't got a rear armrest, we do have headrests, not all 25s came with rear headrests actually, so that's good. No events for any cost cutting in here because uh, we're really kind of pre anything to do with um, the MG Rover era in this car. So it's this is how the BMW group, um, well, was Bidham and Rover together, actually uh, re-engineered this car from the R3 200. Um, there's, you know, they've got everything in, in here that, uh, that it should have, which is nice. Right, let's uh, get in the front, shall we, viewers? 
despite no evidence of Project Drive anywhere, we've uh, come across one of the floors of these uh, 25s. And the door cards are different from the R3 200s, but we, uh, yeah, those things kind of fall off sometimes. Which is the best. Oh, we've got an illuminated um, ignition barrel still. Fancy. And the good old Rover 800 mirror switch as used in the MG X Power SV. Right, let me just uh, pause a second whilst I close the door. Unlike some of the other 25s, we've not got wood in here. In fact, we've got a sort of a, I don't know, what is that, a carbon fibre effect thing? We've also not got a passenger airbag, which is amazing, really. Um, this is the top model of the 25 when it came out in 1999. And uh, that was an option. It's not great, is it, really? I think some of the later 25s do have slightly different door pockets where you can fit a bottle in them. Certainly mine did. This is an early one that didn't have that. These are much nicer though than the original interior door handles, as are the mirrors, which are sort of Rover 75 style ones. And actually, they're chrome capped on this, which is delightful. Stereo location's not great in these. It's really a bit too far down. It's a legacy of this car still having components in it from the R8200. Um, the dash is completely new. Um, you know, in comparison with the original dash in, in the uh, in the R8, the later R8 had a dash very similar to this, and of course the R3200s have this as well. This is a little bit nicer actually. It's actually soft touch, which is brilliant. Um, Drive position's not the best for a lot of people. The clutch in this, it is a cable clutch, and most of them, like this one, it bites. It bites really, really high, like up here somewhere. And so you just have to get used to that. You can adjust it down a little bit, um, but particularly with the R65 gearbox, that a lot of 25s came with, uh, particularly up to the middle of 2003, um, if, if you've got a sloppy R65 gear, what tends to happen is they age and uh, have more miles on them, and a, you know, a, a, a sort of fierce cable clutch that bites up there, it can be a bit difficult to drive at lower speed. Also, the steering wheel, um, it sits a little bit too low, even if you push it up too high. So, drive position in this, compared with something like a 45, is really not as good. But it's okay. Some people, particularly those who are a bit shorter than I am, um, have said that these are fine. Um, I just find them a little bit kind of um, you know, difficult to be on longer journeys, but you know that's really a bit of a personal thing. Instruments are very very plain. Only the uh, mid two thousand three onwards twenty fives, um, which also the ones that started getting the Ford gearboxes on uh, the one point one one point four one point six petrols uh, had the lovely. Um, black on white instruments. These are the very plain instruments. They're absolutely fine. Even on the sporty model, it looks fine. It's just I prefer those. But I don't like the fact that they got rid of the uh, <laughs> good old Lucas key fob that's been in the, you know loads of associated MG and Rover products for years up until this point. And they replaced it with the awful Petron thing. <sighs> Petron key fobs the bane of my existence viewers they are not good uh if you lose one of those or it comes on program to your car yeah you're in real problems you can still actually buy um, replacement key fobs and that way programming them for about 7500 pounds if you need to it's not the end of the world actually with these another thing that goes wrong on these cars is the heater resistor you find that you're Heater is not working on all the speeds. This one has been fixed, which is fine. Um, we've actually got air conditioning and front and rear fog lamps on here. So we've got a full complement of switches there and has the lights nice and easy to push. In 2004, the car did get a new dash when it was facelifted, but whether or not the facelift it was a success depends on who you ask, really. Um, the electrical mechanical changes were made in 2003, uh, with uh, Euro 4 compliant petrol engines, which you take auto emissions zone. Unfortunately, this one you can't because it's a 2000. And, um, you know, the, the systems like that uh, Petron um, remote, um, a lot of people would say go for the earlier 25s if you can, like this one. 
Right, let me get my secret mission documents and see if they go in that glove box. Okay, viewers. Ooh, I don't think we are going in today. That is a shame. But there is an iPod in there, which is uh, interesting. I've been one of those in a while. Also, I've not seen a car in a while from this era where the window switches are in the middle. Obviously, you, you, you can't get electric rear windows in any 25 or ZR. Um, this presumably was to aid uh, switching production from right to left-hand drive when the R3200 came out because very exactly the same on one of those as well. It's a bit of a shame because the R8 had the um, electric window switches on the, uh, on the door. But never mind. Right, let's have a look at this uh, lovely K-Series engine. Here it is, viewers. 1.8 K-Series engine in this application, 143 horsepower. Same unit as in the 200 BRM and the 200 VI that some of you would have seen on the channel last year that belongs to Mr. Richardson from Furious Driving. Changing the cam belt in these can be a bit difficult. It's a, it's a bit... Uh, it's a bit more difficult actually than the standard K series because of the VVC unit and you I think need a special locking tool um, just for the VVC engines to do it. I might be wrong about that though. Same coolant reservoir that was in a lot of the R8s as well. In fact the whole front structure of this car is still um, an R8 200. The front suspension is exactly the same but rear suspension is actually based um, on a modified Maestro arrangement and don't laugh, the Maestro's actually handled quite well for their time, that's why they actually decided to do that rather than keeping the um, double wishbone setup that was uh, in the original R8 and the Honda Concerto. So yeah, the same basic layout as, as lots of those, a lot of the parts are actually interchangeable all the way through, if that makes sense. If you need to do the head gasket on these, it's not inevitable, I suppose, but if you do need to do it, it does happen. The best thing to do is to get an original spec uh, head gasket or a Vic, um, Lotus Elise spec one. Um, Victor Reince ones are very popular. Um, later 25s, of course, didn't have the word Rover on, on here because they decided to just make one type of cover for the MGs and the Rovers just to cheapen out a bit. But yes, a very handsome little car, and I'm looking forward to having a drive on the mean streets of Croydon. So, the base model Rover 25, when the car was launched in 99, was a 1.1 8 valve engine with 59 horsepower. I think it was only available in i trim, from what I remember. By 2001, that engine had been changed for a 16 valve unit with 74 horsepower, which is an awful lot better. The more interesting engines I start really with the 1.4s. There is an 84 brake horsepower version of that engine and an 103 brake horsepower version of that engine. The only difference between them actually is a little throttle restrictor screw. So if you want to make your 84 brake horsepower 25 into the 103 version, all you've got to do is take that screw out, which is a very, very expensive way of increasing performance. That does not 60 in about 10 seconds, so you know, quite fast actually. And the only difference really between that and it's like a ZR 105. I don't know why they called it 105, it's really 103, but I think that's a PS um, output, is the fact that um, you get different suspension and uh, less sort of extra that looks at 25, and actually they're cheaper than the ZRs to be honest as well. Then we get into uh, other engines like the 1.6, that had a hundred and 8 horsepower, you could actually get that with an automatic gearbox, uh, first of all called the Steptronic, remember Step Speed, then there was a 1.8, briefly I think that went out um, when the 1.8 version of the ZR um, came out, the ZR120, uh, that had 118 horsepower, 
Um, there was also an automatic version available of, of that. I think that might have lasted a little bit longer. Then we get into the most interesting version of all, which is... Uh, <laughs> yes, um, the VVC engined 1.8K series. In this car it has 143 horsepower and does 0 to 60 in about seven and a half seconds. There were also some uh, diesels available, but as usual, due to controversial government legislation and all kinds of other reasons, we don't talk about diesels on this channel. What we do talk about is the fact that this car is remarkably nice to drive. I mean, it's not it's not got the nicest um, clutch setup ever, but it has got the Honda PG1 gearbox, which all the B 1.8s did have. Do you about 1.4, 1.6? Actually, even the 1.1. Uh, after the middle of 2003, the Peugeot designed R65 gearbox, which dated back to 1989, that was replaced with a Ford IB5 gearbox because BMW still owned the gearbox factory where MG Rover had their gearboxes made and they put the price up to such an extent that they decided just to use their relationship with Ford and buy some sort of Fiesta or Focus type gearboxes. Uh, those can be quite good, they do get nasty and baggy with higher mileage. Um, this car's done 107,000 miles and this PG1 is honestly pretty good. It's The main issue is this clutch which we talked about earlier, which um, it does take a little bit of getting used to. Visibility um, around here is pretty good, especially when you're trying to get out of these junctions and um, people don't let you out. Thank you very much. Steering is just superb. It's one of the best things about these cars is the steering. Um, it goes right away through um, from the uh, R3 200s, 25s, street wises that came in in 2003, and um, the MG ZRs. Absolutely first class steering. Ride depends on really how knackered your suspension is and what model you've got. This one doesn't seem too bad. They are very good fun cars to drive. You just got to make sure that the driving position works for you, really. Um, and uh, you know, on a long journey, I don't like these so much. Just nipping around town, though, is absolutely fine. Lloyd Vehicle Consulting stickers, t-shirts, and mugs are available by clicking the link to the Google form in the video description below. Right viewers, let's take a look at some Rover 25 trim levels. So when the car came out in November 1999, um, the trim levels were I, it's in like Rover 25 1.1 I, then the IE, the IS, which I've actually filmed an example of um, a couple of years ago, actually, it belonged to Mr. Curry, who's had lots of cars on the channel before, and um, the IL. Then, a little bit later on, they brought out the IXL, which was the top of the range in terms of luxury, and then, of course, the GTI, which is this one. Later special editions, um, there were lots of them, were the Advantage, Advantage S, Impression, Impression S, the Olympic, the Olympic S, the Spirit, Spirit S, then the Olympic Impression and the Olympic Impression S. Very, very um, sort of uh, long-winded trim level there. When the facelift came in in 2004, the number of trim levels was uh, reduced a bit. Um, just I, SI, SEI and SXI. I've got to remember the stage that the ZR was out anyway, so that also offered you know, viewers a it's a bit of firmer suspension and more extrovert looks and things like that. Right at the end of production in 2005, there were three different leather-clad models available. Uh, the GLI, the GSI, and the very, very rare GXI. I don't think I've ever seen one of those. 
So viewers, should you consider a Rover 25 if you're hard earned budget up to a thousand pounds? Or GTI models, I'm not actually sure if you can still buy one of these for a thousand pounds. They're so unbelievably rare um, that, uh, yeah, they do command a bit of a price now and they're only going one way. Standard ones, yeah, there's lots of 25s out there. Um, might want to consider one that uh, doesn't have the infamous Spectron remote, so avoid the cars uh, before the middle of 2003. However, if you do that, your car's not ultra emission zone compliance. And where I am now will be in the ultra emission zone in August 2023. So this car will not be compliant, and so we'll have to pay £12.50 a day to be used. So you win some, you lose some. Anyway, thank you ever so much indeed once again for watching this episode of No Budget Reviews. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like this video, leave a comment below, and uh, we shall see you again soon for more inexpensive motoring.